Hello, welcome to my channel. I'm Julie Torrens. And today I'm going to talk about uh, something that is close to my heart. And in it, I'm going to talk about this new trend in the art community for neurographic art. And I will tell you right now, beyond just the artistic thought of it, I'm really not a fan. I am not a psychiatrist. I am not a psychologist. I am not a behavioral health specialist. And I'm not suggesting that anything I say is advice. But now that we have those disclaimers out of the way, if you feel you're having a behavioral health crisis of any kind, you need to seek professional help. So I'm going to start out this with a type of art that I was taught as a small child, and it was called scribble art. So I'm just going to start, and I'm working in my Dilutions Large Journal. I'm just, with a Sharpie marker, going to do a scribble. Kind of a big scribble. Like this. And join it up at the end. So, when I was a child, we were to do a scribble like this, and the teacher had showed us on the board. And then what I have is some um, watercolor markers. These are Tombow markers. And I just picked some colors. And then we were to, after our scribble was on our paper, to take our crayons and just fill in each space on its own. So that's what I'm going to start out by doing. So what brought me to do this? Carrie Griffiths. And he's called Carrie the Crafter, but his YouTube channel is Carrie Griffiths. He talked about neurographic art and his thoughts, but then he also talked about his behavioral health journey. And that is the part that is just so near and dear to me because I too have my own behavioral health journey. And by being able to hear someone else talk about theirs, it makes me feel more accepted and less alone. So I wanted to do the same for you. And that is to just do some art um, and talk about my behavioral health journey. And maybe something in that will help you or make you feel less alone or more accepted. Or maybe you have somebody in your family or your household that deals with some of these things. And again, just to make, you know, just to let you know you're not alone. Not at all. So, the neurographic art. Well, what they want you to do is to have lines that go from edge to edge and just let your hand kind of guide the process. So it's just kind of like this. And maybe one going this way. And go right off the edge of a page. Now, all of their kind of psychiatric, psychological reasoning for doing this, that's where it all falls apart for me. So, but what they do then is when you get to this part, you just round off these edges and then kind of fill them in. So I'm not going to do that for this whole page, but I'm going to do it for part of it anyway, as, as I talk about my journey with behavioral health. And there are many other artists that are out there that have talk the whole thing through. Um, I've listened to some of them, but again, it's not for me, but it's not for me to tell other people what they should do in their art journey. So am I doing it exactly correct? Probably not. Well, I'm sure I'm not, but I really, I really don't care. I just want to create some art on my page. That's kind of how they round everything off. So, my journey 
started, honestly, it's really a part of my whole life. I don't remember not having the symptoms that brought me to a behavioral health diagnosis. But when I was in my 40s, I had a doctor's appointment because it was my birthday. And at the time I was working at a place that on your birthday, you got the day off so I could make an appointment with the doctor and it wouldn't cut into my vacation time or anything like that. So that day was supposed to be a day off for me, but I was up in the middle of the night and I was worrying about something I had done at work. I'm a nurse. And so it just, it just had me up and I was just, I just couldn't turn my mind off and I was just going round and round that I thought I might've done something wrong or forget. I, I don't exactly remember what the situation was that I was ruminating about, but, uh, I just couldn't sleep. So four o'clock in the morning, I got out of bed, got cleaned up, got dressed, went into work so that I could recheck my work and make sure that what I was worrying and fretting about wasn't a reality. And then I just stayed at work. I mean, there was always work to do. And I just stayed until I went to the doctor's office for my appointment. And so when I got to the doctor's office and he saw me, he said, you look, you look tired. I said, well, I'm not really tired, but I was up all night or a good part of the night and I was fretting about work and I just told him what I told you and he just shook his head and he said what you are describing if it wasn't a panic attack it was certainly close to it and then the other parts that I had described that went on in my life which was I could be up at night couldn't sleep because I was worried about things like, is my child sleeping okay? Or has he stopped breathing? Or is the furnace operating properly? Or did I remember to shut the stove off? Maybe I didn't even use the stove that day. Didn't matter. I was just fretting about that kind of stuff. And I would get up. I would check the baby, check the stove, check that I locked the doors check my husband, check the furnace, go down to the basement, check the furnace, make sure it seemed like it was running properly to me, make sure that I didn't smell smoke, all that. And repeat, repeat until I just couldn't keep moving. Go back to bed, maybe I would fall asleep, maybe I wouldn't. Uh, and, uh, but I usually would because I was so exhausted. And my doctor just shook his head and he said, what you're describing is obsessive compulsive disorder. And he said, you're just loaded with anxiety. And he was right. So he said, I believe that you're having these symptoms primarily at night because during the day you have more things that are um, distracting you. And he said, so he gave me a medication for at night. And it was like a miracle. I didn't realize how much this was affecting my life until I started that medicine and was sleeping and I wasn't fretting over this. Now, worry and anxiety with worry is part of the obsessive compulsive disorder. Anxiety was explained to me is is worrying about future events which for me is is true and then depression is when you're mourning about things that happened or didn't happen in the past and again that that fit the way i felt to a t i did not do a lot of mourning of the past um but the irrational worrying about the future was definitely a part of my behavior. And so, as I said, he gave me a medicine 
And then as time went on, and I was in my 40s then, and I'm in my 60s now. Um, the medicine that he gave me, a lot of doctors, when I say a lot, I mean the doctors that I was seeing, felt that there were better choices, safer choices, and choices that would definitely be more beneficial. And so they tried changing my medicine. They didn't seem to hurt and they didn't seem to help. So I stayed on the medicine that the first doctor had given me. And uh, I only recently, so it was 20 plus years later, got off of them because of the doctor I have now. She too said, there's safer, more effective medications and the medicine you're on, you really shouldn't be on long term. And the medicines that she has given me have helped quite a bit. And so I'm not taking the medicine that the first doctor had given me. I don't feel he was a bad doctor. I feel he was giving me the only thing that they really had at the time. And again, I'm a nurse. And so I uh, knew what a lot of medications a lot of people took. And the medicines that I'm taking were not it. So, so anyway, I'm doing this, uh, or trying to kind of do the rounding off of the junction points where these lines intersect. And I know a lot of people find this very relaxing. It's neither relaxing or not relaxing to me. It, just the fact that I'm doing art is always relaxing to me. But this particular, to say, well, and this really takes the cake, no. Not for me. I do not doubt what other people say. But no, not for me. But anyway, so, after I had the diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder, which I was displaying the the rituals, and that was the check the door, check the furnace, check the baby, check the stove, check the door, check the furnace. That has, as of recently, all but disappeared. I may have a, a fleeting thought of that kind of thing, but I don't, I, I mean, I can talk myself out of it. I can just tell myself that this is irrational worry and you did check the doors and everything before you went to bed and you don't need to do it again. And I can just settle myself that way. But uh, before medication, obviously not. So they added, because I did have some breakthroughs of earlier on now, I'm going back a little bit. I did have some breakthroughs of, of anxiety, including I had a panic attack that sent me right into the hospital because my heart rate was just so fast and I just could not talk myself out of it. And the confusing part to me at the time was that I woke up and I, I couldn't pinpoint to you what I was being anxious about. I just couldn't. I think if I could have, I wouldn't have ended up in the emergency room. I would have been able to kind of reason myself out of it, but I just, I just couldn't. And so I was at the emergency room and that's when they gave me the diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder and um, just told me that time would probably work it, it, it out. And it did, but I missed a day of work, which wasn't good. When you're a nurse, even then, I mean, there was a nurse shortage, not as acute as you feel it today, but there definitely was a nurse shortage at the time. So when you called off, you know, it was it was bad for, for everybody. So, uh, but there wasn't any new treatments. I did, you know, all of that emergency room visit and things went, went right to the doctor. But the doctor really didn't have anything to say and felt that it was just an isolated time. Didn't really know why, but... Anyway, I am so grateful because it got me to study. It got me to understand even better 
when other people talked about these symptoms that I could, you know, at least suggest that they seek some help and that I had gotten help and that it did literally help me. And I was hoping that they would have some help. Sometimes when you're dealing with behavioral help, health issues, you feel hopeless and you feel helpless. Like there is no help because you're thinking about what you're anxious about and you're thinking, well, maybe I'm anxious about my finances and nobody, unless they're going to hand me a boatload of money or a new job or something, there is no help. And you just feel like, I don't need medication, I need money. Or I don't need education or medication, I need, uh, or a support group. I just need whatever it is I'm worrying about, a new furnace or, I, you know, whatever is the worry, you just need that taken away and you'll be fine. But the reality is you'll just find something else to worry about. And as I say, when I read the uh, description of generalized anxiety disorder and they mentioned irrational worry, well, that was just hitting a nail straight on the head for me. It just was because I knew in my heart of hearts that what I was doing to myself was not rational, was not necessary, but I just didn't know how to stop it. And so, yes, am I on medication today? Yes. Does it help? Yes, definitely. And I'm grateful for it. And I'm grateful for the doctor who was willing to prescribe it. Now they do talk a lot about getting psychological help and, and group therapy and things like that. I honestly haven't taken the time to do that. And I've not really had the finances because a lot of those things are not covered by your regular me medical insurance or maybe just a limited number of visits. And you know darn well it's going to be more visits than that. I mean, at least that's the train of thought that I have. So I... Uh, I just haven't explored that yet. So I'm going to go ahead and I, I think I've widened out and joined up like I'm supposed to. So I'm just going to fill in a few more of these with color the way that I was taught back as a child. Always enjoyed this. Still do. And I think you could make some brilliant backgrounds and, um, you know, cut them up, put them like take your punches and punch different shapes out of the designs. And I think you could have something really beautiful. The marker I'm using right now feels like it's really trying to dry out. And this is a water based, water soluble. It still moves once it's dry, if you get it wet again. And so it may be, I don't know, but it may be simply that this marker has, maybe it had the lid off and it got dry, but maybe there's plenty of ink in it. So now that I'm done, I'm just going to dip the tip in water just for a few seconds. And then I'm going to put the lid on it and set it aside and leave it alone for a while and just let it kind of equalize itself up a bit. So when I was going to art school, so this is beyond just the scribble art, but uh, I was in art school at the Toledo Museum of Art. The teacher had us do another scribble, which I was well, happy to do. But then she had us not fill in the spaces with color, but to fill them in with texture, drawn texture. And oh, did I love that. And she, of course, did some examples to show us. And we had already been working on textures kind of one at a time in our drawing class. And so we already had some, some tools in our arsenal that we could utilize in the exercise that she gave us. 
And so I'm going to be doing some of that. But I, uh, I did write Carrie, told him that I was going to be doing this video that I'm doing right now. I am going to link his channel, not just because of the topic, but his art is amazing. And as I said to him, I don't just watch his videos. I drink them in. They are just so fantastic. Do I do everything he does? No. But have I learned some techniques and some styles? And has he inspired me? Oh, in so, so, so many ways. And there are times in his videos that he talks about his life. And he's about my age. I'm 63. I think I said that already. But he... uh talks about, you know, the journey that he's had through life. And it's just one more fascinating phase than, than the other. It's just wonderful. And I enjoy it so much. And I've learned so much about cruising and about his life as an actor and his life as a, sh a chef, a pastry chef. Just amazing and all art oriented. And I just appreciate it so much so I hope you'll take a look at his channel like and subscribe just like I hope you do for mine and leave him a comment as I said before if you feel like your behavioral health is getting the better of you and getting into your day-to-day -day living and that you just cannot get a hold of it get a handle on it Seek professional help. There's not an answer that is a one-size-fits-all. You need to talk to the professionals. And, you know, just depending on what's going on in your life, your primary care provider may have you see a psychiatrist or a psychologist or may simply try a, a simple treatment of their own. Um, it, and it doesn't necessarily involve medications. Don't be afraid, especially with your healthcare provider, to share what's going on. It's, you know, the days of, of just locking people up and, and, and closing the door, they're over. They just don't operate that way anymore. Now, there are techniques and there are therapies that go back literally centuries but there's also much newer thoughts and much newer ways of treating people with different behavioral health issues and you can always listen you can learn and make a decision for yourself and just how it is that you want to move forward there are also groups that are totally free that you can just, you know, look at your community calendars and uh, see if there's something that way. Maybe it's grief and there are many grief support groups or maybe what you're dealing with is more in line with, um, oh, I don't know, taking care of your loved ones at home. There are a lot of groups and, and support groups for things like that. And maybe that's got you down or again I I don't even know what to suggest because I, I don't know everything there is to know about behavioral health mental illness and and what you need but do seek help because I do know help is available and it's available at a variety of ways of costs of specialties get help How about one more of this color? And I still may color some more. I'm not sure. I didn't plan on coloring them all. Just some. And then filling in some with the doodling and with the texture. And I wanted this in my art journal because, as I said, this truly is a, a dear-to-my-heart conversation and the fact that I'm sharing it with you I want that to be in my 
art journal and I will be writing on the back of the page just what we talked about and the date and, and all that because it is a part of my history, a part of my journey, the day that I shared it on YouTube for the first time. Now, there have been other people, Diane Reevely, she has talked about her behavioral health situations and I have written to her one-on-one -on -one and thanked her. Um, but at the time, I didn't even have a YouTube channel and it just, it, it didn't occur to me at that time to do something like I'm doing today. But today was the day. The generalized anxiety disorder, although it's not new, the diagnosis is fairly new and you're able to learn more about it. There's more information that you can read and the things that your doctors might be looking for or signs and symptoms and little tests you can take and all that kind of stuff. Now, you know, I'm always cautious with Dr. Google. It's not the same as professional help. But once you've had the professional help and you do have a bona fide diagnosis, then you have a little bit of a launch pad where you can go and you can find sources that you consider reliable sources and find out. And again, support groups. There's some support groups that are totally online. There's even now where you can get counseling online. Pardon me. <coughs> where they say that you're dealing with licensed professionals. Now, how that all works, I don't know. Is it true? I don't know. It's not something I've looked into. But it has come on the scene pretty recently. I do know of people that have sought help like that and have found it quite beneficial. Sometimes it's in the form of a subscription where you're given, I am one of them that I heard about, it was a YouTube person said that um, they pay a monthly fee and they get a once a week one-on-one -on -one visit, but then there's support groups within that you're invited to join and just that kind of thing. So again, you know, and once you seek professional help and if you do have a diagnosis, a title to what it is that, that you're dealing with, then you can aim yourself in the right direction for help groups and things like that. A lot of different ways to skin a cat. And not every way works for every person. It's individual. And I have chosen to make my situation public. That's not for everyone. And I respect that privacy. People that have written me, people that I'm in contact with, that have dealt with behavioral health and things in their life, I, I don't talk about those people. That's their story to tell, not mine. And I believe strongly in that. As a nurse, we deal with HIPAA in the United States, the Privacy Acts, and I take it very seriously. Obsessive compulsive disorder has been misunderstood and people have labeled themselves. And then when they've talked about the way that they believe it manifests in them. And I, again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not saying it, but it certainly doesn't match up with anything I've read or anything I've experienced. And it makes me a little sad when people will say something like, well, yes, I keep my closets very neat because I'm, I'm OCD. Well, are you? Because I am. And whether my closets are neat or not doesn't have anything to do with my OCD. Nothing. 
but I'm not saying that it doesn't for other people. But sometimes I wonder. Because what I have gone through before medication with my OCD has been painful. Maybe not in the same physical pain as a headache or something, but still painful to my to my heart. So I'm just always careful in how I talk about my obsessive compulsive disorder. And again, not everyone's manifests the same as mine. I'm well aware of that. But again, when someone screws the lid on tighter on their salt shaker at a restaurant and says, I'm OCD. I think, really? You sure? Because I am. And it just doesn't seem to add up to me. But if it makes them feel better to say something like that, you know, I don't, I don't try to correct them or try to shame them for saying that. It, 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 there's no point doesn't help. If it's not going to help and it could hurt, I just leave it alone. I do know that behavioral health issues are more common than people realize. When it comes to generalized anxiety disorder in young people, it's like one in four in the United States. That's a lot. It's a lot of people that are affected. Now, I'm not saying that all these people have been institutionalized. I've never been institutionalized for my behavioral health. Now, if, if you looked into crystal ball and said someday you will be, well, that doesn't surprise me. But I like to think that I will seek help before I get that far out of control. But one doesn't know. I don't know what the future holds. And then I was reading, I was trying to think in adults. The numbers are large, not as large as one in four, but for generalized anxiety disorder, and, and they've got guidelines as to how many times a week you are um, experiencing signs and symptoms and what degree and, and how they affect you. That's all spelled out so there are specific guidelines but it is common so I used a heavy heavier sharpie marker to do this texture and now I'm going to do a, a thinner one and do a different type of texture I am not going to ask that if you have behavioral health issues please put it in the comments that is not an appropriate way. If someone wants to talk about it, they'll talk about it. And if someone feels like, no, I respect that. We all have to deal with these things the way that works best for us and the way that professional help, if we are involved with professional help, the way that those people have advised us to deal with it. But just throwing it out there on a YouTube comment, I have a hard time believing that that was someone's plan of care. Get out in public and just shout about it. No. Doubtful. Very doubtful. As a matter of fact, I think if I did that, some of the things that I fear in people knowing what's going on with me would be more likely to come true if I stood on a street corner and yelled about my situation or if I just went from YouTube channel to YouTube channel and threw it in the comments like spam I have OCD how about you no nope I just don't think that's helpful so there's another texture and I'll pick another space and do some more texture. I won't get this finished in this video, but I just wanted to open up and share a little bit of 
of what is going on with me when it comes to behavioral health and that if it's something that is in your life, you are not alone. And it is not a sentence to being a miserable person for the rest of your life or to go with sleepless nights forever and ever or to be shunned or to be scorned or to be bullied. No, no. And even, you know, maybe you've got a, a doctor, your, your primary care provider could be a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. Maybe they're your friend on the outside as well, or maybe it's just someone that you've been seeing for over 20 years and it's just too hard to admit. Well, you can always just say to them, I'm having these behavioral health symptoms and I don't know how to deal with them but I'm not comfortable necessarily with talking to you about it. Is there someone you could recommend? They'll understand, they're professionals. Their, their purpose is not to brag or to blab about what's going on in your life. A very wise person told me, because one of my worries is what are other people thinking of me and that person said, other people do not think about you as often as you think other people are thinking about you. This is a manifestation in your mind, but people do not ruminate and talk about and think about you as much as you ruminate and think about what other people are thinking or saying or doing in regards to you. And it's so true. That was so freeing when someone told me that. It just gave me permission to stop thinking about what everyone's thinking about me. They're not. It was a big help. Really, really was. So I do hope that you're finding this video helpful informative maybe you can feel a sense of acceptance because I certainly do accept people that have a behavioral health diagnosis I really do you know to me it's it it's no different than if you're a diabetic or you're dealing with coronary artery disease or kidney failure or whatever it is. It's just a medical diagnosis and I hope that you're getting appropriate treatment for it because I want you to have a better quality of life. Going to get behavioral help is not like a jail sentence. It is not a punishment. And people are more eager and willing to help you than you realize. The things that we conjure up in our heads are often not the reality of how these things are dealt with. And you know, it's, it's something that we don't sit around the dining room table and talk about. And that's one of the reasons why we can feel more alone, but it is a private matter but you're not alone. You're really not alone. Okay, well, I am going to finish this up, but I hope in the meantime, you might consider doing a piece of art like this, and I hope you found this helpful, educational. Please consider the like and subscribing to my channel. Thanks.